I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to see such a wonderful crowd here. And I know you're going to be um, very interested in, in uh, Dr. Garibald's talk. So thank you for joining us. And my name is Myron Friedman. I'm the director of the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. It's my honor to serve in that capacity here. I want to thank you for joining us at the Rachel Miller Lecture in honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And first, I would like to thank our sponsors, Carolyn Kenneth Adishek, who made today's program possible. Thank you, Carol. Their generous gift made in honor of Holocaust survivor Rachel Miller is a testament to their dedication for sharing this important story. So thank you again. I would also like to thank our members, including members of the Guardians of Remembrance Society. Do you mind raising your hand if you're a member of the Guardians? Wow. Shortly before the program, our guardians held a reception with today's featured speaker, Dr. Michael Berenbaum. And if you are interested in becoming a member of the Guardians of Remembrance Society, please touch base with a staff member or visit the welcome desk after the program. Our guardians are a very integral and important part of how this museum is able to continue into the future. So we would appreciate everybody becoming a guardian. <laughs> 100%. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> we would not be here without the incredible support, though, of all of our members. So I would also like to take a moment to thank our entire membership, our staff team, each of whom played a crucial role in making this weekend possible. And thanks to all of our amazing volunteers whose dedication we so highly value, and we couldn't make the trains run on time without them. So once again, to our amazing volunteers. So now to introduce today's speaker, please welcome our Director of Education, Helen Turner. Thank you, Myron. I'm incredibly honored to welcome Dr. Michael Barenbaum to the museum today. Dr. Barenbaum is the director of the Sidney Zeger Film Institute exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust and a professor of Jewish studies at the American Jewish University. He's the author and editor of over 20 books. He is also the executive editor of the second edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica. He served as the project director overseeing the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the first director of its research institute. He later served as president and CEO of the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which took the testimony of 52,000 Holocaust survivors in 32 languages <coughs> and 57 countries. But I'm sure as many of you know, this is just a small fraction of Dr. Berenbaum's accomplishments and the measure of who he is as an incredible man and scholar. So while I could go on, I wanted to highlight how he comes to be with us today and the importance of this particular talk. October 7th will now be a date upon which we mark a before and an after. As we have all grappled with the aftermath of the events that unfolded and continue to unfold, Dr. Berenbaum has been and continues to be on the forefront of contextualizing these events and the anti-Semitism we are seeing all over the world today. Naming, contextualizing, and connecting events is crucial to giving them both meaning and aiding our understanding of them. Dr. Berenbaum, Dr. Dr. Berenbaum's use of the term pogrom to describe October 7th is both powerful and thought-provoking, and gives us a historical context with which to explore current trends in anti-Semitism. After Dr. Berenbaum's talk, we will have a facilitated Q&A by yours truly, 
So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Barrowman to the podium. Thank you very much. You have me on now? Okay. First of all, thank you very much for all the kind introduction. Um, I have to tell you, uh, I, I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to talk about my hosts and this town. I have to tell you um, uh, just a story. When I get my little kind introduction, I'm reminded of uh, the first award I received in the media was something called the Silver Angel Award. <laughs> now, you have a problem when you get a Silver Angel Award because who do you tell? <laughs> I tell my wife, uh, she said, would you please remember to put the cap on the toothpaste and, <laughs> and lower the seat. <laughs> if you tell your teenage kids, they believe you're the devil incarnate. <laughs> so I did the only thing that an honorable man could do at that point, which is I called my mother. <laughs> I called my mother, she says, I know you're an angel now, try being a match. <laughs> So after such an introduction, I hesitate to speak. <laughs> Let me um, say that, uh, first of all, I'm proud to be in, in St. Louis. Uh, I'm going to tell you three St. Louis stories. One is about your origin and its importance and impact. Many years ago, um, my colleague and friend, and once my boss, Yitz Greenberg, um, came to the idea that in the aftermath of destruction, Jews had always created new institutions. The synagogue was created in the aftermath of destruction the temple. And he believed that Holocaust resource centers that told the story of the Holocaust and educated the new generation had to be the institution that we created in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And the first community in the country that pioneered this was St. Louis. Under your federation director of those days, Bud Levin, if I remember correctly. And this was the first place that pioneered that. And that was one of the things that had a tremendous impact because when we got the buy-in from President Carter to create a President's Commission on the Holocaust, which to recommend an appropriate memorial to the victims of the Holocaust, that gave us the opportunity to think about creating an institution which then became the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. None of that would not have happened without the buy-in of the St. Louis community way back in the 70s. And you should be very proud of the pioneering role that you played. Now to um, more humorous stories about St. Louis, which is, uh, some of you don't know, but I'm a baseball historian. <laughs> I took a psychological, so when you work with the Holocaust all this time, you sometimes need a psychological break. <laughs> took a psychological uh, break from it and wrote a book, um, uh, a third of a book, uh, Who Ruled New York, Willie Mickey or the Duke? about baseball in New York when I was a young child and you grew up in a neighborhood nearby. And I had the weakest hand, which was uh, the hand of arguing that Duke Snyder was the best center fielder uh, of that era. It could not have been true, but it didn't matter if you were from Brooklyn, you could argue anything. <laughs> witness, Alan, witness Alan Dershowitz, who argues good, bad, and so on. Uh, we opened the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and I get an invitation for a, to take a VIP tour, uh, Stan Museum. I go into my garage, and I, when I go into my garage, I take out my Stan Museum bat, my Stan Museum <laughs> first basement glove. And I come down to meet Stan Museum with my uh, baseball bat and my baseball glove. And who do I meet? I meet Father Stanislav Museum, which is Stan Museum's uh, uh, original name from Poland, who then looks at me with a very great smile and says, you know, in the United States, I can meet anyone I want. 
And I was a 10 year old boy, uh, not a longer a professional 10 year old boy, who was profoundly disappointed. <laughs> and uh, I never did get it signed by Stan Musil. But for all of us who grew up in those heyday of baseball, he represented the class of the, of, of the baseball um, game. And um, uh, I ended up meeting a wonderful man who was a pioneer in Jewish-Polish relations and everything else, Father Stanislav Musil. <laughs> I still am a little bit embarrassed by the 10-year-old boy that I became, who looked disappointed as I had to put the bat and the glove away. But that was one of the great uh, claims of St. Louis. Third is, is I'm happy to be here in the winter because I was a Danforth fellow. And um, we went to a game in, in the old park and we began, we had been all day in suits and ties and everything else. And by the end of the game, uh, those of us who were of the male uh, gender were uh, down to our t-shirts and I came home and wanted to wring out my suit pants. <laughs> and the like, and we only had mercy for these very well-kept, very well-dressed uh, professional women who were our colleagues who could not remove garments <laughs> and who are, uh, were probably less interested in the Cardinals than we were in those chauvinistic days and who um, uh, looked absolutely disheveled by the end. So I learned that if I go to uh, a baseball game, in the middle of summer, it's shorts and a t-shirt and some uh, uh, Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say, uh, the reason I'm beginning light is because we're not gonna talk heavy. And I wanna talk heavy in a couple of ways and I'm going to not sweeten it to you until the end. The Jewish people in 1945 made three basic decisions. Let me step back by saying that theologically, the two most formative events in Jewish history were on the 15th of Nisan and the 6th of Sivan, the Exodus and the standing at Sinai. Historically, I believe very deeply that the most important day on the Jewish calendar is the 10th of Av, the day after the destruction. <coughs> and the reason is because we are the only ancient people who reimagined ourselves and reinvented ourselves after destruction, which is why we are now 3,200 years old as people. And you have to look at what we did on the 10th of Av, the day after destruction, that says how we re-envisioned, re-imagined, reconfigured ourselves in order to continue who we are. We made three basic decisions in 1945, let's call it the 10th of off. The three decisions are number one, we would continue as Jews. Not everybody made that decision. I was a colleague of Madeleine Albright of the late Madeleine Albright. And when I met her before, before she was UN ambassador and secretary of state, she told me her story. Her parents were Czechoslovakian nationals. I heard that story, and I taught with her at Georgetown University for, for many years. I heard that story, and I said, that means they were Jews. I said to myself, you had Czech nationalists, you had Slovakian nationalists, but if they were Czechoslovakian and social democrats, that meant that they were Jews. Because where do Jews thrive? Jews thrive in a democracy, and Jews thrive in a pluralistic society. Now, Madeleine Albright's family made the decision to forget their Jewishness and to make it the third rail of family experience, so much so that she, who was one of the brightest people I knew, did not understand emotionally her Jewish background, even though she had Jewish cousins. You gotta ask yourself, why is a woman blocking that unless the third rail of family experience was being Jewish? 
We have other people. If you go to Poland today, people are coming out of the wall. I'm a member of the board of the JCC of Krakow. People are coming out of the wall who are discovering now, 80 years after the Holocaust, that they have Jewish blood and Jewish ancestry. I worked with a colleague at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Only when he began to work at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum did his mother tell him that she was Jewish. He did not know that of his own mother. He's a historian who should have what understood his family background. So the decision that the bulk of the Jewish people made was to remain Jewish. The second decision we made was the future of the Jewish people would be assured by an independent state with an army, a flag, a language, and a culture that could defend the security of its citizens. The third decision that we made was that for those of us who were not going to go to this independent Jewish state, we were going to be protected by those democracies that respected human rights, human dignity, and freedom of religion, including the freedom of Jews to be Jews. And our great achievement of the last 50 years, not 80 years, but 50 years, has been that we've broken the back of the, the slogan of emancipation, which the slogan of emancipation was in Hebrew, it sounds rhythmic. Be a Jew in your home and a man in the street. And we enjoyed a period of time in which Jews could be publicly Jews, and not only privately Jews, reaching the point in which the glass ceiling was broken for Jews. Slowly and surely, remember we used to have a period of time where you needed a Jewish country club and a Jewish hospital because what? You weren't admitted to the other country clubs, you weren't admitted to the other hospitals. Doctors could not practice there. And St. Louis is no exception. And who was the one man nominated as a Jew for the Vice President of the United States. Not an inward Jew, but a person who could invent the term 24-6 because he was a religious Jew who took off the Sabbath. And we had the capacity. Yitz Greenberg told the story when he was at Harvard, you only wore a um, hat and you took it off when you entered class if you were an Orthodox Jew because you would not go bareheaded. And he would come back to Harvard, see these young men with their mini-skirted, beautiful uh, girlfriends walking hand in hand. And what did, he, what did he be jealous of? He'd be jealous of the capacity they had to, what, to wear a yarmulke. And Henry Wusowski, the provost of Harvard, said of Harvard, when the Jews, and, and let me say it to you this way, in 1923, the greatest Jewish scholar of his generation was a man by the name of Harry Austin Wolfson. Harry Austin Wolfson was a Harvard scholar who rumor has it that he twice left the Weidman Library. But nobody ever saw him outside of the library 24-7. And he wrote an article in a Jewish journal called The Menorah, Some are born blind, some are born lame, some are born Jewish. Being Jewish was a handicap. Henry Rosofsky, who was the, the provost of Harvard, and a German Jewish refugee who was married to an Israeli woman, he was offered the presidency of Yale. And his wife said, You have to take the presidency of Yale, you're going to be the first Jewish president of Yale. And he said, Let me be the first Jew to turn down the presidency of Yale. <laughs> Since then, Yale has had three Jewish presidents. Their current president is a Soloveitchik, most prominent name, in, in, not with the last name Soloveitchik, but the, the most prominent name in Jewish orthodoxy. And the idea of Rosofsky said when Harvard came and moved its hill out to the center of campus, he said, we Jews had gone from the periphery of campus to its center, and here we intend to remain. What am I saying? I'm saying that essentially, even in the United States, the question of who we're going to be and what we're going to become and what the role of Jews is going to be in the society is now up for grabs. 
And you see it in your exhibition as we have to deal with the period of 1918 to 1933 and with the history of anti-Semitism in a way we never had to deal with it before. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you the two great decisions, two of the three great decisions that we made are now up for grabs. Which shouldn't depress us, which should engage us, because we can turn that around. Now I'm going to give you um, what I think are the most important tools for us to understand about anti-Semitism. And then we'll talk post-October 7th. And I have a, a personal problem with that because my sister's birthday is October 7th. And we were planning to have a, um, she had a mile, my Israeli sister has a milestone birthday on October 7th, 2023. And we were going to be in Israel a week later in honor of, for a party in honor of her milestone birthday. We went to Israel anyhow, but we surely didn't have a party. And what, uh, my sense of our trip to Israel that time was that we went to pay Shivako. Everybody we saw was a Shivako, including my sister, my, nep my nieces, my nephews, etc., etc. It was all because something had been shattered in the entire society by it. But let me give you the basic elements of anti-Semitism. I want you to understand four words, and then you'll see the framework. Anti-Semitism differs as to its source, it differs as to its goal, it differs as to its priority, and it differs as to stability. So I want you to keep in mind source, goal, priority, stability. Clear? Source of anti-Semitism. Source of anti-Semitism, the oldest source of anti-Semitism is clearly religious. Source of anti-Semitism can be political. We hear an interesting echo of that in Charlottesville when they say the Jews will not replace us. We even heard that in Poland where it, in Charlottesville it didn't make any sense. In Poland it makes less sense if they had said that in Poland 80 years ago, 90 years ago, when Jews were 10% of the population and 30% of the urban population, when they were doctors and lawyers and writers and intellectuals and all of that, Jews will not replace us, might have had a meaning. Now you're talking about a community that can barely take care of itself, if at all. They will not replace us. There is political anti-Semitism, and we hear it in all sorts of ways. And how is it the 2.5% of what? Of uh, the American population can replace? This is replacement theory. And we also hear it in uh, terms like there's an invasion from the southern border sponsored by an 89-year-old, now 92-year-old Jewish survivor. We hear it when uh, a congresswoman speaks of what? The Rothschilds setting fires uh, from outer space to uh, the forest fires in California, political anti-Semitism. There is social anti-Semitism. Groucho Marx put it humorously, I never want to belong to a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> and we understand that all of the institutions, the whole Catskills as a phenomenon in New York was created after what they barred one of the richest Jews of his generation from saying, staying at the Sagama Hotel on Lake George. So he built bigger and better and essentially got this, uh, the sense of social anti-Semitism. And social anti-Semitism has been with us. It used to have the five o'clock shadow. By the way, we've had a tremendous decrease in social anti-Semitism. Let's use the very interesting example Old man Joe Kennedy would have turned over in his grave if one of his children would have turned over you know, while alive if one of his children had married a Jew, and many of his grandchildren are married to Jews. 
And that is not only because of their own love, but because the collapse of what? The social barriers that were involved with that. And we've seen and we've been the enormous beneficiary. There's economic anti-Semitism. Jews control the banks, Jews control what the movies, Jews control news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's cultural anti-Semitism. If you look into the history of culture, you see the manifestation in Germany. Manifestation in Germany was in degenerate art. The manifestation was in the work of Richard Wagner, who said what well, Mendelssohn couldn't be a great composer because the Jews don't have it within their capacity and the whole range of the idea of the elimination. And the ultimate form of anti-Semitism became racial anti-Semitism, with all due apologies to Whoopi Goldberg, who saw racial anti-Semitism, black and white, the Jews were defined biologically based on the religion of their grandparents. That's not, that led to the situation where Roman Catholic priests, Roman Catholic nuns, right? and Protestant ministers, and I was taught by a great Protestant theologian who was a Protestant theologian from 1913 to 1935, and then from 1940 to 1967. And in the years between 35 and 40, he was considered himself religiously as a Christian. By the state, he was defined as a Jew. The idea of racial anti-Semitism was Jewish blood, and Jewish blood was regarded as a cancer on society. And that meant, uh, we'll see that in a moment when I say source got the range of sources. Second element of anti-Semitism is gold. If you have religious anti-Semitism, the ultimate goal is conversion. You're in, that's called anti-Judaism. And the ultimate goal is conversion, and you have a whole range of communities that had missions to the Jews. And even the evangelicals who are our deep friends in terms of support for Israel at this point have the idea that the Israelis returning to their land are essentially because we're a witness people, and in the end when Jesus returns, which is an imminent return, we will again recognize him as the Messiah, something we denied that opportunity, what, 2,000 uh, years ago. And consequently, the idea is, uh, again, the goal is conversion. Interestingly enough, Pope Francis eliminated the mission to the Jews. He said Jews are fine in their relationship with God. The original covenant still holds. We don't need to missionize them. We can missionize the heathens, the non-Christians, the non-Jews, to come to the true religion, but Judaism can be left, what, alone. It's a very significant step. Political anti-Semitism, the goal is the diminishment of political power. In some cases, it has been expulsion. Cultural anti-Semitism, again, the idea is to, and you see it, when you look at the book burning, the age of Jewish intellectual dominance has ended. All of that means that what we're going to remove Jews from culture, and we're not going to uh, have them as part of our culture. Racial and anti social anti-Semitism means, uh, again, social segregation. And uh, ultimately, the goal is separation. And uh, you then have, and, and and you also have racial anti-Semitism. Under Nazism, the goal they use the term extermination, and if you're using Nazi speak, you use extermination. What we mean is annihilation. And the reason I want you to make sure you distinguish between Nazi speak and ordinary speak is because we all have exterminators, or what cockroaches and vermin and and. And, and the like, the rats. But extermination of a human being means already you teach the human, you treat the human being as vermin. And that's a dangerous, that's an enormously dangerous conception. But the goal is annihilation. So we have a distinction, 
again, between source and goal. Let's go to the third, which is priority. Part of what made the United States of America good for Jews has not been that there's no anti-Semitism here, and has not been that uh, there's no discrimination here. It has been that Jews have never been the priority, never been the first priority for the expression of hatred. Now, if I look at you today and we see a rise in hatred, we, and we see a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism, we have to see that that rise is in the context of what? The increase of the permissibility of the expression of hatred in our society. Other groups are higher in the priority. I have a, a joke that I tell. I have a, a wife who's a wonderful uh, woman and a competitive woman. An athlete and competitive athlete likes to finish first and appreciate that. I had to tell her during COVID, this is an exam you have to flunk, not pass. <laughs> and essentially I say in this, it's wonderful that you're not number one. Where are we number one today? We're number one on those universities that have begun to accept DEI, diversity, equality, and inclusion, which are positive dimensions. So they turn to the Jewish community, they say, congratulations, you are white. And then they add two more words, privileged oppressors. And we look and we say, okay, we have achieved quotation marks whiteness, even though we're not all white. But, and we may have even achieved privilege because of the work, but we don't come from privilege. That's not our origin. That's not who we are. We come from the immigrant generation. We're a couple of generations ahead of what? Of the people who are now in that position, but we have retained an idea. You know, it was, it was uh, the attack against George W. Bush who said George W. Bush was born on, and I don't mean this politically, I mean this as a description. George W. Bush was born on third base and he thought he hit a triple. <laughs> we understand we weren't born on third base. That somebody in our family, if we're born on third base, in our, if not lived memory, then certainly in our cultural memory, somebody hit a single and somebody hit a double. And if we ended up on third base, it was because we started off with what? Being behind the eight ball, being behind home plate. And all of us have that story to tell. And where we came from, we can even see it in our migration of neighborhoods. And the idea of white privileged oppressor doesn't quite fit and doesn't quite come and we see the oppressor also in the question and the perception of Israel, and we'll come to that in a moment. So white privileged oppressor becomes part of what we have with the EI. Priority, very, very important. And by the way, if you see anti-Semitism on the campus, we're talking about anti-Semitism primarily on elite campuses which says something very significant about where we're going to be when these people come into leadership and have that type of perception. And even, but even the Jews who are white privileged don't wear the badge of oppressor as part of the baggage that they carry with them. And then we say, and I can say this in my own, um, I was speaking to, to um, one gentleman today whose father, uh, whose grandfather was a rabbi in Selma. Well, I was in Montgomery. I didn't, I didn't go to Selma because by the time we white people were down in the civil rights part of that, the march had gone over the Pettus Bridge and was on the edge of Montgomery. I marched in the civil rights movement. I was a classmate of Andrew Goodman Oppressor, wait a minute here, we got a different background, we got a different history. We weren't here during slavery, during Jim Crow. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the story I tell of myself. The last and the most, uh, again, a very important thing to consider, remember, source, goal, priority, stability. We Jews, the axiom is the more stable the society, the more secure it should. The opposite is also the case. The less stable the society, the less secure it should. And the other part of it is you have to understand that we in the United States, and this is, I can go globally, but I'm not going to take the time today. We in the United States now have essentially experienced a health crisis that led to an economic crisis. We have a political crisis, we have a crisis of truth, we have a crisis of polarization. We have a crisis essentially of confidence in the fundamental institutions of the United States of America. And the question becomes, what does that mean in terms of stability? It means that Jews end up being in a situation in which all of a sudden we're insecure Precisely that. We are the canaries in the mine. What is a canary? If you put a canary in the mine because if there's a lack of oxygen, the canary knows it first. The miners understand if the canary starts making noise, get the hell out of there. We're not there yet. But anti-Semitism is essentially an, ex an expression and an understanding of precisely what happens when the society is unstable. Let me give you a moment of contra testimony, then switch to Israel and switch to tools here. Understand this, that something is remarkable, and I only have the statistics from 2020. Judaism in 2020 was the most admired religion in the United States. Now, what do you mean the most admired religion in the United States? The best way to understand that is it's the least unadmired religion <laughs> in the United States. The Catholic Church has a major crisis between division between the pews and the pulpit, and the pulpit has been discredited by all of the sexual scandals associated with the church and the cover-up of the hierarchy of the church, and also the fact that on key pronouncements, the um, teaching of Catholicism is not accepted even by Roman Catholics who go to tradition, who go to, who go to church to mass. So, for example, Catholics have the same rate of divorce as the American population, the same rate of, um, of uh, abortion as the American population, the same rate of contraception as the American population. And essentially, they preach as preach, and the people behave differently. And there's also a crisis between a conservative hierarchy that's even at war with its own pope and a much, much more liberal parishioners that is different, and the outside is seeing that divisions within the Roman Catholic Church. Protestantism is divided between mainstream and evangelical. And evangelical is now divided by age and by politics. My uh, children, especially my younger children, do not understand the difference between being gay and being left-handed and they're left-handed. Can't say that of my generation. They have no idea why gays are not accepted as a general part. And in fact, in terms of American political life, the most intriguing thing is imagine if integration was accepted with any degree of which marriage equality was accepted and gay marriage has been accepted in society, it would be in a different world dramatically. Younger evangelicals are divided over the issues of gays. By the way, the Israeli orthodoxy uh, shows precisely the same range of division, at least until you get to the Haredi community. It's divided over even uh, environmentalism, and it's divided over the degree of absolute identification with the Republican Party. 
So you have a division, and by the way, it's also divided with the uh, absolute support of Israel, which is something that is troubling uh, a number of people, most especially the right wing in Israel. Religious anti-Semitism, so Judaism, because, uh, nobody, uh, and uh, Islam is divided, uh, it is regarded as somehow uh, associated with terrorism. We've been at war with, uh, with terrorists, therefore we must be at war with Islam, and nobody understands Eastern religion, so Judaism is ipso facto the most admired religion or the least disadmired. And we can also say that the percentage of, this, of the population that is anti-Semitic is less than it was 40 years ago, than it was 60 years ago, and certainly than it was 90 years ago. What is the difference? And here we get to the tools of anti-Semitism. The first thing is that the haters now have the internet. The internet means that you can broadcast, to communicate, and create a global movement with very, very, very little cost. And everybody's carrying this. The second element of that is social networks, which means the haters have a sense of community, and therefore the notion that Jewish organizations had a generation ago that we can quarantine and put to the margins of it doesn't work because they have a mutually supportive sense of community and they are becoming a global phenomenon. And the social networks that use all of the apps mean that you have no room for a sophisticated argument and no patience for a sophisticated argument. It has to be said in 250 characters or less. And the great standing occurs when you have the essentially the hatred being expressed and the more extreme and the less sophisticated, all of that comes into bearing. That's a new tool that we have not had. And it's a tool that is enormously impactful and even though Jews are at the forefront of that type of revolution, it is now being used in a very intense way to ferment anti-Semitism, not only anti-Semitism, but all forms of hatred, racism, anger, etc., etc. Means if you go on the internet, you can find community and meaning and purpose and information and fake news and, uh, and, and, and misinformation all the way through in the internet. And that's a brand new environment in which to take it. Let's go now to Israel. Let me give you a way of identifying anti-Semitism versus legitimate criticism of the state of Israel. And we have to say it, and we can say it truthfully, that there is plenty of reason to criticize the state of Israel. And uh, there is legitimate criticism of the state of Israel. And I, I said, I, I told somebody the story. I have uh, an Israeli uh, sister. My sister made Aliyah 50, uh, uh, two years ago. And my sister has raised her children, her grandchildren in Israel, all of whom have served in the army. I have two great nephews in the army. And um, I speak to my sister very often, most especially during this period of time. And I follow the following. When I call my sister, I put her on speakerphone. And I do whatever else I'm doing for about the first 20 minutes while she rants about the situation in Israel. And then when she says, how are the family or how are you? I understand that she's ready for a conversation. And essentially, I have become one of her uh, less expensive th uh, therapists because I make the call and listen to her. So the Israeli, and when I was in Israel, and I've been in Israel during this period of time, when I was in Israel, everybody is ranting and raving and angry and disappointed. And something, I uh, two things have been intriguing 
every trip to Israel up until about five years ago, every one of my friends got to be prime minister. <laughs> and we used to only talk politics. About five or seven years ago, none of my friends want to be prime minister. <laughs> And these are people involved in the political situation, and nobody wants to talk politics. They want to talk culture, they want to talk ideas, they want to talk literature, they want to talk anything other than politics. Why? Because they're despairing of politics. I went to the, uh, we had a, I went to, uh, I go to Israel uh, several times a year, and I, I even have a, a business partner in Israel, so I speak to Israel several times a week in, in some of the work that I do. And I went to the protest movements and I found it was terrific. I saw everybody I wanted to see. <laughs> so I went to Jerusalem, I saw everybody I wanted to see in Jerusalem. I went to Tel Aviv, I saw everybody I wanted to see in Tel Aviv. And it was a grand um, social occasion. Uh, but that tells you who I associate with, which are you know, no goodness, but interesting no goodness. What's the criteria? Nathan Shlonsky gave us three criteria, which is the balance between anti-Semitism and legitimate criticism of Israel. They're easy to remember because we call them the three Ds. Double standards, delegitimation, and demonization. If you judge Israel by one standard and everybody else by another, you're coming to the brink of what? Anti-Semitism. Let me give you a, a terrible example of this, and I'm going to deal a little bit later with the genocide issue. But I want to tell you this as a military historian. If, well, if you quote me, you're going to put if at the beginning, capital I, capital F. If we are to believe the figures of the day, 25,000 uh, people in Gaza, and that's the claim of the Gazan Health Ministry. I certainly would not take that to the bank. And if you believe the Israeli quote that 9,000 of them have been uh, Hamas fighters, and I'm not sure I would take that to the bank either, then the ratio of those killed are less than two to one. The ratio of civilians being killed are less than two to one. If that is true in the nature of urban warfare, that is in one sense unprecedented in urban warfare, where the infrastructure lies amidst the civilian population. I'm not sure it's true. But as urban warfare, that's an unprecedented type of thing. Didn't happen, for example, at Dresden. Also, the ratio was about nine to one. So the question of double standards becomes, and that's not to say we're not seeing horrific images from Gaza, and it doesn't make my stomach churn. It's just to say that if you're looking at that and the question of urban warfare, you have to look at that. The second thing is delegitimation. Let's say that Israel now has occupied land that does not belong to it and, and uh, dealt and displaced the native population. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like the United States of Iraq. That sounds like Canada. That sounds like Australia. That sounds like 27 other countries for whom that impacts. If Israel has, therefore is illegitimate, doesn't have the right to exist, then the United States doesn't have the right to exist, Canada doesn't have the right to exist, Australia doesn't have the right to exist. And the question of delegitimation then means, now that's not to say that there weren't Palestinians who were displaced, that Israel did not engage in some ethnic cleansing way back in 1948, and that there are not those in Israel today who would not like to engage in ethnic cleansing. The third is the question of demonization. Is Israel the source of all evil? And you see again a morphing, what we call in the non-professional literature um, uh, of, that my kids use, a whack-a-mole. You know what a whack-a-mole is? You knock down something here, it pops up there. 
what is the whack-a-mole of the Black Plague and of the um, of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, the Black Plague and also the idea that we slaughter uh, uh, the innocent children uh, at, at Passover and make the matzahs. Uh, what's the equivalent to that is the claim that Israel is essentially uh, killing Palestinian children in order to harvest their lives. Of which, by the way, there is zero evidence. And one of the reasons that, that you can guarantee that there's zero evidence is because one of the great stories of the successful integration of the Arab population in Israel is the hospitals. Where uh, Arab doctors work alongside Jewish doctors, where Arab pharmacists work alongside, um, uh, uh, alongside uh, Jewish pharmacists, and they treat each other's wounded and each other's population all the way through. And I believe if Israel was harvesting the organs of Palestinian children, some of the Palestinian Arabs in Israel who are in these operating rooms would begin to what? To speak up. So the question of demonization, is Israel the source of all evil? That becomes one of the identification points involved. And we've also seen the question of uh, the, the question arise that people who want to accuse Israel of things will not even come clean on certain forms of oppression. So people who are leaders in the women's movement who say you gotta trust everybody who complains, that they mean everybody who complains with the who makes a contention with the exception of the Israeli women who were raped on October 7th and October 8th all the way through, even though we've seen that, and we have people who have what? Who have photographed what they did. And you guys know better than anyone, because you have a museum here, of photographs of the killings and the oppression during the Holocaust taken by what? By the perpetrators who are proud of what they're doing and who, even though they're not supposed to say it to anybody, want to what? Document it. Because it makes them excited by what they've done. So all of this is taking place in the world in which we live. What does that mean to us? With this, I'll conclude until, uh, until Helen interrogates me further. <laughs> and we'll give you all the opportunity also to answer some questions. What does that mean to us? First of all, it's going to mean something that we haven't experienced in a very long time. My grandparents had the idea to swear to sign an eat. It's difficult to be a Jew. Not for my generation, been the easiest thing of all, uh, the easiest thing involved. Even to be a religious Jew, everything now is kosher. You know, we are traditional Jews. We change all the dishes, all the all the things. Passover, I mean, we went to a Passover place that was serving French toast. <laughs> French toast made out of uh, a sponge cake. It was to die for. <laughs> and if you go to one of these Passover hotels, you gotta lose 20 pounds before you go because you get up to eat, you go to eat, you go to eat, you go to eat, you go to eat, but there's nothing you can. It was easy to be a Jew. We now need to develop tenacity. And the other thing we need to develop, and here I'm gonna use another uh, St. Louis analogy. Ken Burns had a wonderful uh, nine-part thing on the history of baseball. And one of the people he quotes in it, and, and I, had, I saw that when I had the flu, and if you have the flu, you fall asleep during everything. So I saw that, I must have seen it about 12 or 15 times until I was able to see one of the enemies through. Uh, and somebody brought it to me, and I was just sitting there and, and saw the first part, the second part. I'm not sure I ever saw the whole thing. 
we had a scene there that was absolutely incredible. Uh, an African uh, American ball player wanted to rip off his skin because he wanted so badly to play in major leagues. And then Kurt Flood, the great St. Louis outfielder who broke the reserve clause, and his lawyer, ironically, was Arthur Goldberg, broke the reserve clause in, in baseball. And it's the reason we got a guy by the name of Tommy who's made seventy million dollars a year as a free agent and is going to be a great thing even if he can't pitch. <laughs> Kurt Flood said, said something that I, I keep repeating to my kids. I never objected to having a black skin. I just wish I had a thicker one. Jews are going to have to develop a thick skin. I tell that to my kids all the time now. It's going to be tougher, it's going to be harder, and we need to develop tenacity, we need to develop toughness, and we need to develop a sense of what being able to take it, and we need to continue on our mission of education. Now let me conclude with something we started with the decisions we made in the aftermath of the Holocaust. You have done one other thing, or let me say not only you, but we have done one other thing. We've done the most deeply Jewish thing imaginable without quite knowing it. What did the biblical generation do about the Exodus story? It remembered slavery not to bemoan the past, but to intensify the ethical obligations we have to the future. Because we were slaves, we have a Sabbath. Because we were slaves, we cannot work, withhold the wages of the worker. Because we were slaves, we have a whole range of obligations to a better and more moral and more decent and more equitable society. What have we done with the Holocaust? We have made the Holocaust into the, and this is education, we made the Holocaust into the negative absolute of the world in which we live. People who don't know what's good, don't know what's bad, know the Holocaust was the ultimate of evil. Even somebody as brilliant as Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's looking to attack Nancy Pelosi, Unfortunately, is looking for the word, so she develops the idea of the gazpacho, please. <laughs> poor, woman, poor woman has probably never had gazpacho, because the rest of us who have gazpacho understand what a wonderful summer <laughs> soup it is. But she's looking for the word gestapo. We've made the Holocaust into the negative absolute but we've done it in order to expand human responsibility, intensify human decency, to oppose racism, intolerance, discrimination, and all of the types of prejudices that don't judge individuals on, their, on themselves and their merits. And we'd make it a cornerstone of moral education. And that has to intensify in the world in which we live. We need to understand things about the past that we didn't fully explain. So we need now to deal with anti-Semitism and with the in fact, impact of conspiracy theories and with the notion of, of the transformation of democracy into authoritarian, ultimately totalitarian society. And we need to be able to do this in a world which is going to challenge us. Now, having promised that, let me tell you the one thing about genocide. We also need to discuss what genocide is. Israel has the capacity to commit genocide. Israel has the excuse to commit genocide. Israel even uh, has an interest in committing genocide it would be wonderful if Israel could have what it imagined, what the some segments of the Zionist movement imagined we could have in the, in the beginning, 
which is to a people without a land, a land without a people. Not true. There were people there, etc. But we have to remember that we could have had a Palestinian or Arab state in 1947 if partition had been, had been accepted. In 1948 and 49, if there was the acceptance of the borders of the State of Israel. Could have had it again in 2000, except that Arafat chose Intifada uh, II, we could have, which was not a non-violent <coughs> Intifada, but a violent Intifada. We could have had it during the period of time with, uh, with uh, Ehud Omer uh, and the like, as well in 2008 and the like. Each time the Arabs have gone, again, the Palestinians have gone against it. And each time we have not had it, so that's not the issue. And we're probably, ironically, it looks like Bibi Netanyahu has done more to revive the notion of Palestinian state than any Israeli leader in recent history, even though he opposed it completely, because nobody understands how you're going to control these territories. But one of the ways you can say that Israel did not commit genocide and is not committing genocide is look at the expansion of the Palestinian population. Look at the number of children that have been born, the number of people being brought into the world, and look at the sheer numbers. If they were committing genocide, they're lousy at it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't criticize the leadership of the government of Israel, not the policies of the war. Leadership of the government of Israel who were used by South Africa as evidence of genocide. One genius said, let's nuke them. Not realizing that if the men had come from the west to the east, what would have happened to the Israeli population? Another one says, let's recolonize Gaza. So if you think Israel's a colonial operation, Let's tell the people we're going to recolonize Gaza. The third one says, let's get rid of the population, which is ethnic cleansing, which is one of the elements that are involved. So we have a problem of leadership. And the sadness is that only a confirmed anti-Semite could believe that the people of Israel have the leadership they deserve. And only a confirmed anti-Semite and anti Palestinian could believe that the people of Palestine have the leadership they deserve. At this moment in time, uh, we have, in the United States, leadership that has stood strongly, remarkably strongly with Israel, and at a political price that's going to be paid. And that means that we're in a, a problematic situation because now standing with Israel is a political negative instead of a political positive. We have to be tougher, we have to be stronger, we have to be more active, and we have to do and continue and be better at doing what we're doing. Thank you. So I wanted to thank you very, very much for your lecture. And every time I hear you, I'm sure you can see my ferocious notes. I'm always taking notes on what you're saying, and I love your delivery and how you make something so undigestible, like anti-Semitism, how you break it down into a way that we can see it and see the patterns of it, which I think are so crucial. So I wanted to begin for us um, with, I think, the question that's really on everybody's mind all of the time at the moment, um, which relates to what you were talking about with anti-Semitism. We can see the patterns, we can see the history, we can see the current events. And when you talk about developing this tenacity, this thicker skin, um, I wonder if you could share with us um, what you think that we as individuals and as institutions can do to combat anti-Semitism. Very, first of all, uh, as expected, it's always a very good question for you. <laughs> let me uh, say that, let, let's go back for a moment to the events of the Tree of Life Synagogue. <clears throat> Very interesting events at the Tree of Life Synagogue is not only what happened with the attack. The attack was the most significant anti-Semitic attack in the history of the United States against Jews in which 11 Jews were killed. What happened afterwards was absolutely pivotal. 
The anti-haters were there immediately. The mayor was there who said, we don't want this to define Pittsburgh. The governor was there. The district attorney was there. The police chief was there. And then the community came forth. What did the community do? Look at what happened with the community. The Pittsburgh Steelers, the football team, put on a Jewish star. The Pittsburgh Penguins, the hockey team, put on a Jewish star. The World Series was interrupted for a moment of silence. And then Squirrel Hill, and Squirrel Hill was Mr. Rogers' what community. Squirrel Hill came forth and said, we're in this together. The most important thing that happened was that the Muslim community came forth with a quarter of a million dollars because it showed that they had assimilated enough to understand that religious freedom is a cornerstone of the United States of America. And unless the Jews were to be what? To be protected, they would not be protected as Muslims. And that means that the way to respond to this is by intensifying civil society. I didn't speak about two things, and I'm sorry I was long enough, I didn't get a chance to say it. Let me talk about it. We have power we never had before as a community. And we have friends. And we have to both use our power and use our friends and work with our friends in order to bring forth and to work for civil society. And we have to be there for civil society. Even at the university, it's not that everybody is going in one direction. We have friends, we have allies, they have to come forth and we have to be part of it. And we can say we need to live in a society where we can disagree without calling the other what the enemy and the oppressor. And what I keep saying when I'm on campuses is I keep saying, look, we have one war, we don't need a second front. We, by the way, have four fronts right now. We don't need a front in the United States. We're not going to solve that problem. But we can be an example of how to what? Talk about that problem in such a way that we can come to areas where we understand each other and areas where we disagree with each other. So the most important thing for us to do is to build on our resources, to strengthen civil society, and also to call forth a certain sense of solidarity. Um, let me tell you a, a story. Does everybody know the story of Billings, Montana? Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of you know the story of Billings, Montana. For everybody, it's worth telling. Um, Many years ago, the haters came into Billings, Montana, and they identified, there were 80 Jews in Billings, Montana, and they identified the Jews by people who had menorahs in their windows. And they threw a rock through the um, home of the leader of the Billings, Montana Philharmonic, and it missed his son, thank God, and the like. What happened afterwards was the most important thing that happened in the aftermath. A minister ordered those little aluminum menorahs. You know, the aluminum menorahs he used to have. He ordered the aluminum menorahs, he gave them out to his congregation, and he said, all of you are to put a menorah in your room, in your window, so when the haters come by, they can't tell who is or who is not Jews. If the haters are anti-Semitic, we're all Jews today. The newspaper then picked up on that and published a full-page op-ed editorial, which put them in order, and they said, hang this in your window. And consequently, when the hater came back, they were defeated by what? By the solidarity of the community against hatred. So if a swastika is painted, we have to reach out to the ministers, the priests, the imams, the mayor, the district attorney, the police chief, and some of the intellectual leaders who come together to wipe off that swastika and say, that will not define Pittsburgh, it will not define St. Louis, will not define Billings, Montana, will not define the United States of America. And by the way, that's one of the things that George W. Bush did so brilliantly right after 9-1-1, in which what? He went to a mosque and he said, we're not at war with Islam. The, the, the role of civil society is absolutely essential to it. 
and in the political sphere, the collapse of that and the world into multiple camps that hate each other is a profound danger to the stability and the integrity and the values of American society. And I don't want to get into politics, but it is profoundly dangerous for us to be in that situation. Um, so my next question for you is um, really what was kind of the beginning of our conversation. Um, I've been an admirer of yours for many years, but I um, reached out to you after you began using the word program to talk about October 7th. And I was wondering if you could go into your choice of that word and why it's so important. Ladies and gentlemen, the good news is we're not in the second Holocaust. And this is not 1933, and it's certainly not 1938. That doesn't mean we don't have problems. And I deliberately use the word pogrom because pogrom is what happened in 1903 in Kishinev. Led to Bialik's great poem, Ira Hariga and led to, a, by the way, led to the creation of the American Jewish Committee, and led to the migration of a whole range of people who understood it was time not to be there. It also, I used it very specifically because it's a fundamental challenge to the State of Israel. The obligation of the State of Israel is to protect its citizens. It failed on that obligation. And the idea that a pogrom could take place Pogroms generally were done in which the power in the, the, the political power either turned its back or surreptitiously cooperated with the killers. Now the idea that the state of Israel was not in a position and was incompetent in defending the lives of its citizen is the reason that when I went to Israel, I was paying a shiva call. It was a fundamental challenge to the raison d'etre of Israel. And a fundamental crisis in what Israel is and what Israel represents. Now, I, I, I spoke in Israel um, uh, the other day, and I said something as they were discussing anti-Semitism in, in um, the diaspora, I said something that um, got everybody infuriated, but nobody could disagree. And I, it, it was made worse because I was speaking in Hebrew. So I said, I, I say this with pain and anguish in my heart, with a broken heart. At this moment in time, the most unsafe place in the world to be a Jew is the state of Israel. Now that's a bloody scandal. That somehow was not supposed to happen. That happened, that's why I use pogrom. Now, what is it that that also represents for us? Look, the stakes at this moment are so great. I've been saying for years now that for the last 25 years, we've been refighting the Six Day War, different means. By the way, war is supposed to be politics by different means. We've been refighting the Six Day War. We are now refighting the War of Independence. And the outcome is unsure. That's why all of us are in a moment of great discomfort, of existential discomfort in the world in which we have somebody ask, how am I? And I say, considering the world. And then I say, you know, my part of the world is fine, but that's the equivalent of saying, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Mrs. Kennedy, how was your visit to Dallas? <laughs> We're in a moment of existential crisis because this was not supposed to happen. Pogroms were our past, not a reality in which we experienced. And what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying also to tell you that anybody who calls this a Holocaust is not understanding what the Holocaust was like. I am convinced that if I thought it was 1933, in any which way, I would have learned a lesson in 1933, which is to get the hell out. 
I'm not telling you to leave. Now, I'm also not telling you, and, and, and uh, I'll tell you a, a story. Um, we had a demonstration. Um, our synagogue is at, uh, at the edge of uh, Beverly Hills and Los Angeles. If you go 100 yards away from our synagogue, you're in Beverly Hills. Go to our synagogue, you're in Los Angeles. Uh, I live in what we call the Beverly Hills, the slums of Beverly Hills, which is, which is when you get down from the hills, you're on the flatland, you're in the slums of Beverly Hills. We used to be Beverly Hills. They um, gave it over to Los Angeles because we weren't fine enough for Los Angeles. By the way, these are homes that are thoroughly overvalued, and I can't imagine, you know, all of that. We had uh, a demonstration um, scheduled for 3 o'clock on a Shabbat afternoon. They deliberately chose to um, march in a Jewish neighborhood, and they deliberately show, chose Shabbat afternoon. My own synagogue did something that I went ballistics over. They rescheduled the afternoon service of Shabbat afternoon, Mincha Marav. They rescheduled it for an undisclosed location. And they did not hold service at the synagogue. And several of us rose and said, that's what we call in my field, anticipatory compliance. They're not going to drive us out of our home. If we can't trust our own security, then we sure as hell have to trust the security of Los Angeles and if Los Angeles cannot protect us, we have to go to our city councilwoman, who is a member of the synagogue, whose kids go to its schools. We have to go to the police chief. We have to go to the mayor. And we have to say, we want protection. And if we can't get protection in them, they have a reciprocal agreement with Beverly Hills. This is not the time to back off. It's not the time to not to demand civic protection. I have an Israeli flag in my window. I have a mezuzah on my door. And I'm not backing down. I walk to shul with a kippah on Shabbat. And I, uh, and I, I do that um, uh, much to the chagrin of, of, of sometimes my kids. I do that in Rome. I do that in Paris. I do that in Florence. I do that wherever the hell I travel. And I'm not going to back down from being a Jew. And that's it. If they want to... They want to come at me, I'm here. And we had a, a tremendous discussion in the synagogue about what it is to act with strength. It is not the time to back down, it's the time to develop a tough skin. Um, thank you for that. Um, I now kind of want to, I think, almost staying in the same vein of, of not backing down and having to make challenging choices. Um, I know you are known um, all over the world for incredible achievements, but I think you are most well known, particularly in these circles, for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about what it was in that moment to open that museum and perhaps to probably break some taboos or some silences in what you were showing and delving into. Wow, what a, wonderful, what a wonderful pleasure. That's a different, it's a different speech, but let me, let me tell you um, the basic thing. Um, we had opposition to creating the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It came from three sides. Number one, um, some Jews were afraid that we were only telling the story of Jewish dead. We even have a, a wonderful critic, uh, Daryl Horn, who says what? Uh, the world loves dead Jews. And if we're going to tell the story about um, Jews, why doesn't we tell the story of the Holocaust, only the story of the Holocaust, why don't we have something else? And that was one sort of opposition from within the Jewish community. We had a second sort of opposition from within the Jewish community, who at that point said all the resources should go to Israel, don't create something in the United States. And ironically, one of our opposition was Yad Vashem at that point, which felt that we were going to be a rival. They didn't understand that competition made both, made both of us better. And Yad Vashem developed its new exhibition only because we developed our exhibition and they had to up their game. They did up their game. They created a wonderful exhibition. 
and we now are the best of friends and the friendliest of competitors. The third opposition were people who didn't want, who didn't believe that we could make a Judeo-centric statement in the center of American national life and say that it had something to contribute to the American future. We paid a particular price for that. And one of the unique contributions of my own work is to show how you could include the totality of the Nazi victims, and you do it in this museum as well, without diluting, diluting the Judeo-centricity of what happened. But we had to have confidence that the Holocaust was such an experience of power that it had something to contribute to the American future. And by the way, we just proved it because we had the Auschwitz exhibition at the Ronald Reagan Library. Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, was just the Reagan Library. And the first question we were asked is, why is it at the Reagan Library? Why is the Holocaust at the National Mall? And the answer is because the Holocaust was an act of government by a charismatic leader. The great communicator was Ronald Reagan. Adolf Hitler was a great communicator. What is the difference between both places? The American government in its best has checks and balances, notion of inalienable rights, separation of power, restraint on the power of government, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of expression. An America that is America would not allow a Holocaust to happen in what? In the United States. The power that Ronald Reagan had to communicate could be communicated for evil or for good. Agree with him politically or not agree with him, he didn't communicate hatred. He didn't communicate anger, he communicated a positive vision, which by the way may be an enormous critique of our current politics. But having said that, that's why it was at the Reagan Library. We drew 97.5% non-Jews, and I would say of that about 99% of them Republicans. <laughs> So we had a, a, a tremendous audience that we would not have reached if we had been in a different location. And part of what our challenge was is, how do you speak to the whole American people? And the irony is the museum was controversial until it opened its doors. And then the people spoke. And everybody wondered, what are we going to do? How are we going to reach the farm? the farmer from Iowa. And then we had a terrific problem. Three months after we opened, two months after we opened, we had to beg people don't come. <laughs> because we were being overwhelmed by people. What a wonderful problem to have. I, by the way, if you tell persons, I had an existential problem, which is I had done everything I could imagine doing in my 40s. I was too young and too poor to retire. So I had to, and this goes back to what I said about the, I had the opposite of the 10th of Av, I had a great, tremendous and wonderful triumph. And then I had to say, what the hell am I now going to do? And I'm, I'm a lousy administrator and the institution had to be managed by administration. And thankfully they didn't give me the administrative task because I would have been bored silly and would have been lousy at it. So I started doing other things, and uh, it became, you know, my anchor and uh, something I'm deeply proud of. And the, um, they're now rethinking the exhibition, and the staff has said there's one rule of thumb, and the exhibition now is 30 years old, seen by 50 million people. I'm bragging now. Don't want to brag too much. Uh, seen by 50 million people, it's 30 years old. And the staff has laid down the law, above all, don't blank it up. <laughs> Polite word would be to say, screw, I won't use the other word. But uh, that's part of what we showed is that we have something profound to say. Now, part of that is the importance of the event of the Holocaust. Not every event could speak as dramatically to what, it has, what America is and what America has to remain. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are going to conclude our program today. 
Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for International Holocaust Remembrance Day and for Dr. Birnbaum's lecture. We are greatly appreciative that you made the trip here. Friends, we will see you next time. Friends, we would also like to thank you so much for being here today um, and for all the days that you support us. We also really want to hear from you about our programming, about what you would like at the museum, and about how we can always be improving. If you would like to direct your cameras to the screen, um, it will take you, if you open up your, your photograph app, um, it will take you to a survey of the museum. We love to hear from you. We also have the QR code at the front desk, along with Dr. Barenbaum's work on the USHMM, uh, the world must know for your purchase. Again, I want to thank you all so much. It has been a privilege and an honor to sit here, and we hope that you will be well and you'll come back to the museum again soon. Thank you.